it is amazing to me to see exactly what God tells us to be looking for to be happening. When we approach the last days, what we should be expecting is this, instability. And more and more we're seeing instability throughout the world. And that instability is going to be a problem that is going to have, at first, a very ungodly solution. Now, if you were to ask, what is the least likely place in the Bible for the church to study? You know what the answer would be? Prophecy. We need to know prophecy. For example, in the book of Revelation in chapter 19, it says that the testimony of the Messiah, that is the character of Christ, is the spirit of prophecy, meaning this. The more you know prophecy, the more that you'll understand who Messiah is and why he has done the things that he has done and why he will do the things that the Word of God demands that he must do. So we need to have a prophetic perspective. And when we look at a key prophecy, and I'm going to begin by going to Daniel chapter 8, because there, there are some beasts, and prophetically, a beast is an empire. And there's going to be an empire that rises up and we're told who that empire is. In that eighth chapter of Daniel, it says that it's paras umidai. And that is the Hebrew way of saying Persia and the Medes. And we're talking about Iran. And Iran is more and more in the news. And Iran is indeed a catalyst for worldwide instability. Now, you live here in Evansville, Indiana, and you may not know, you may not hear what's going on in the Middle East. And I say that because it's not frequently reported in America or Europe. But Israel, almost every week, attacks Iran in Syria. Iran, for the last four, five, six years, are trying to move more and more military assets into Syria for what they want to do, and that is to destroy that nation. And what we see in the book of Daniel is this, that this Iranian coalition, and there's going to be other nations joining with Iran, we see that in the news. We see that they're making a coalition with Turkey. There was great conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That is being settled. And what we can expect is Iran to grow and to become more of a nuisance throughout the world. And when you read Daniel chapter 8, what we can expect is this, that because of this rising up of that beast called the ram, that the world is going to grow hopeless. The world is going to have discouragement. And as things get very difficult, they're not going to see, that is, the world will not see a way to overcome that beast, that evil empire. And then the Scripture says, suddenly, without any type of expectation, there's going to be another beast, that is, another empire that is going to rise up, but this time not out of the east, but out of the west. It's going to be European. And if you read carefully in Daniel chapter 8, that empire that's called the goat is the Antichrist empire. And I think it's so interesting that when we read in the Gospels, for example, in Matthew's Gospel, Messiah is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And we can expect that there will be great conflict, 
not outside the church, but within the church. Because the Bible tells us that there is an apostasy coming. What is apostasy? It's moving away from the truth. And let me ask you a question. Don't you see that happening today within the church? That there is much confusion. What 20 years ago would never have been acceptable would have in a consensus be seen as sin, abomination, unacceptable. So much of the church is embracing. And the challenge that I have for you as we watch Israel, see, many people believe that it's going to be Israel that will go through this, this time of tribulation. That's true. Israel will. But before that happens, and we're going to look at a text in a moment, because your pastor talked about that fig tree. Well, we are commanded, and he's speaking to disciples, to watch the fig tree. And when we see that fig tree growing, blossoming, then we know that things are about to happen. And Israel today, don't believe what you read on the newspapers or see in the Internet, that Israel's in a state of imploding. Nothing could be further from the truth. Things are good in Israel. And you also read that there's much excitement about the third temple, the red heifer, all lies. We live in Israel. There is no talk among the Jewish religious community about this. Why? What is the position of Judaism? That we wait for Elijah. And until Elijah, and it's based upon the book of Malachi, until Elijah returns, nothing is done in regard to the next temple. The priests are not being prepared, as some say. It's all untrue. But what is happening? Well, we're going to study God's Word. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to look at Luke's Gospel. Your pastor quoted Matthew and chapter 24. But we're going to see in a parallel passage what, what Yeshua taught, that is what Jesus said, in regard to Israel and what the church should be expecting, what we should be prepared for. So look with me to Luke's Gospel and chapter 21. Now, these, according to Matthew 24, are some of the things that are called the beginning of the trials. And these are birth pains. And birth pains happen for a reason. Something is going to change. There's going to be something that's brought into this world that's new. And therefore, Messiah uses this term. Look, if you would, to Luke 21 and verse 10. Then he said to them, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Nation will rise against nation. But if you look carefully at that word for nation, it's literally where we get the word ethnic from. What Messiah is saying is that there's going to be ethnic conflict throughout the world. So one ethnic group is going to rise up against another. That's happening. We have an extension of our work in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a nation that's in conflict. And many are being put to death for one main reason. They belong to a certain tribe, a certain ethnic group. And this type of conflict is going to broaden throughout many different places in the world. You may not know it, but recently we were in Kosovo, and we see that there's much ethnic conflict 
between those in Kosovo and those in Serbia. We know what's going on in the Ukraine and with Russia, and things are not going to get better. Don't believe that. The church is not going to be successful in bringing order into this world and bringing about the conversion of the world. We will not see that. The prophets don't speak to that. It may be popular, but it is not biblical. So look carefully at this verse. Nation will rise against nation. And now we're dealing with, in this next part, countries where it says, and kingdoms upon kingdoms. And then there's going to be great earthquakes in various places. And also there will be famines and pestilence. And that word pestilence in the original language is in the plural. There's going to be great diseases that's going to manifest themselves. Now think about this. Ethnic conflict, wars going on, earthquakes, famines, diseases. All of that is going to bring this world into chaos. And why is it happening? Well, God says these things must be, but, and hear that, the end is not yet. And when Messiah speaks about the end, the end that he's speaking about is the end of the church age. Now, as I look out at you this evening, if you were to ask me, what is the primary message for the church at this time? This is how I would answer. Pick up your cross and follow him. In other words, be ready to suffer. The cross is an emblem of persecution and death. And there's going to be a time of intense persecution of one for their faith. And by the way, it's already began. And it's going to get worse. Notice what the scripture says here. Look now to verse 12. But before all of these things. Now, in this case, he's not talking about timing. He's talking about before in the sense of in more importance than all these things is what he's going to speak about now. This is important to God, and therefore we should pay the utmost attention. He says, before all of these things, they will cast their hands upon you, and they will persecute, and they will deliver you over for synagogues. Now, we have to understand how that would have been understood back then. A synagogue is a Greek word. It is a place of administration. You hear synagogue, and you think of it as a Jewish religious place of worship. Now, in the time of Messiah, these places, these synagogues were used for that, but not as a primary purpose. These were community centers. These were places where government administered. And therefore, what he's saying here is not, they're going to take you to synagogues as we think of it, but, but community centers, places of governmental administration. And they're also going to put us into prisons. But notice what it says. And they will bring you before kings and rulers. Why? Well, notice who he's speaking to. This is going to happen, he says, on account of my name. Those who are being persecuted, those who are being delivered over, this is happening to them because that they have a connection with the name of Messiah. And understand in the Bible that this word name is synonymous with character. 
It's people who are demonstrating the character of Christ in their life. And by the way, that's what we're called to do. And I believe this separation between the sheep and the goats are going to be based upon who are willing to stand up and manifest the presence of Yeshua, the presence of Jesus Christ in their life. There are places in this world today, if you do so, you will be arrested. You will be persecuted. This morning, I was speaking at another church, and before the service, I was sitting in the pastor's office, and he showed a picture of a woman holding up a Bible. But that Bible that she had was handwritten. And this woman, who is a believer, she has been beaten, she has been in prison, and her father has been beaten with rebarb, where most of the bones in his body have been broken. He cannot move. He is bedridden, all because of that name that they hold dear. Now, you may think that happens in other places, but I hope you see something. Are you seeing change happening in this country? And it's not change that is good and is going to get worse and it's going to become more hostile for those who demonstrate the character of our Lord and Savior. And some, and there are false believers, those who Messiah will say on that day, depart from me, for I never knew you. These who are weighed down with the cares of this world. Those who will say, well, I accepted him because I thought he would help me in this area. I thought that he would solve these problems. But if believing in him is going to cause me problems, huh, that's not what I signed up for. There's going to be that separation. And I believe that separation has already began. Look at verse 13. These things being persecuted, being delivered over, these things being hated, these things have a purpose. What does he say? Verse 13. And this will bring, and this word means an opportunity. It will give you the opportunity to testify, to bear witness. See, what's happening is this in this world. Things are becoming dark so your light will shine brighter so that you can be singled out as a true follower, one who obeys and leaves the consequences to God the Father. That's what we're called to be. And the world is changing so that we can document our faith. That's what we're called to do. And the world is going to provide that opportunity for us. He says, this will be as an opportunity for you for a witness. Verse 14. I like this verse. You're called to give witness. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be placed into prison. And what does he say? Verse 14. Therefore... Set your hearts not to prepare your defense. In other words, don't give any thought on what you're going to say. Trust him. Believe what he says he's going to do. Because he says, for I will give you a mouth and understanding. And when God gives you the words, when he provides that perspective, his perspective, that gives you his understanding, what does he say? He says here, 
that no one is going to be able to speak against you, and no one is going to be able to stand in opposition of those who are against you. Verse 16. He says, but you will be delivered over. And this is where it gets really difficult. See, making him your savior, we all want a savior. We all want that helper. But is he truly your Lord? And in the scripture, people are going to be challenged. Does he come first? What is he saying here? And you will be delivered over by parents and siblings and relatives and friends and some from you they will put to death. Now, realize, whenever we talk about the last days, we have to make a distinction between the wrath of God and satanic persecution. Satanic persecution, his plans, his activity, goes all the way back to the garden and it will not stop until the kingdom of God, that new Jerusalem, is established. When Satan will be no more in this world, he will be in that lake that burns forever with fire and brimstone. Yes, during the millennial kingdom, he will be bound, but he will be released for a short time. We need to understand that satanic persecution is in this world. But if you are a believer, you will never, ever, ever experience the wrath of God. These things, God is not the source of this tribulation, this persecution, those who are being put to death. God is not the author of this. He's allowing it for a purpose. He says, and some of you will be put to death. And then he says, look at verse 17. And you will be hated by, what does your Bible say? All. All those who belong to this world. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, I would encourage you to do so. You are going to find in the book of Revelation, there's two groups of people. Those who dwell upon the earth and those who dwell in heaven. Now, understand something. It has nothing to do with where they are physically located. It has to do with their citizenship. Do they belong to this world or do they belong to the kingdom of God? And those who belong to the kingdom, those who have entered into that new covenant by faith through the blood of Messiah, those will be hated by all those who belong to this world. And I don't know about you, but I see not an indifference to our faith by governments throughout the world, but I'm seeing a greater hostility towards those who have a kingdom hope, those who have a kingdom citizenship. And things are going to get worse. He says here, and you will be hated by all. Why? On account of my name. But there's a message of hope. And a hair from your hair, head, will not be destroyed. And look at verse 19. Interesting scripture. He says... 
And in your perseverance, now understand something. You are a new creation in Messiah. You have been born again. You have been regenerated. You are not what you were. And when we look at Messiah's message to those seven churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, he says something to each of them. He says, he who has a spiritual ear, an ear to hear what the Spirit says. And that is a message of overcoming. In the true faith, through the Spirit of Messiah, you will endure if you trust him. You rely upon him. You will overcome. That's what the church is called to do. Even in being put to death. See, death is not a problem for us. Because the foundation of our faith is resurrection. And when you study in the Bible and you come across resurrection, something that speaks to it, almost without exception, Resurrection is spoken about in a kingdom context. When the Bible speaks of resurrection, it points to the kingdom of God. So it doesn't matter if they put me to death because my hope is not in this body. My hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the establishment of the kingdom of God. And what he's saying here, if you look carefully at verse 19, it's kind of similar to Matthew 24 and verse 13. There it says, He who perseveres will be saved. Now, so many people wrongly understand what that verse is saying. It does not mean that through my perseverance, I earn salvation. You know, that word salvation is used in a wide variety of ways in the Scripture. It can be used for financial well-being. It can be used for physical healing of a physical disease. It can be used for spiritual healing, being set free from demonic possession. It can also be used for the forgiveness of sins and that kingdom hope. But that word, in its simplest meaning, salvation, is related to victory. When he says, he who perseveres to the end, will be saved. It's a statement of encouragement. It's telling the reader, continue on. Don't give up. Be encouraged because in the end, victory is coming. We can be assured. God cannot lie. There is victory at the end. What end? The end of the church age when there's going to be a wonderful transformation. And we can see that as a type of resurrection. You know where the resurrection is emphasized by Paul? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then our faith is in vain. The resurrection is foundational. And in that same 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, towards the end, he speaks about a mystery. What mystery? The rapture. Why is it called a mystery? Because it was not something that we see clearly spoken of or promised in the Old Testament. It's something that's unique for those new covenant believers. 
It's not part of the law. It is part of that new covenant that was ratified, sealed, put into power by the blood of Messiah. Look again at verse 19. In your endurance, in your perseverance, what will happen? It says, you will purchase your souls. What does that mean? Well, that same word is used to speak about the authority of God, that he is the creator over all things, that he is Lord over all. And what the Scripture is simply saying is this. As you endure, as you persevere, there is going to be spiritual change that happens to you. You are going to grow, and you are going to be able to have authority over your life. And that authority that you will have will be in agreement with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It means that you are going to finally be overcomers whereby you submit to perfectly the will of God. That's why it's so important that we endure. And then he says, look at verse 20. But whenever you shall see Jerusalem being surrounded by encampments. It's a word for soldiers, but a camp of soldiers. Now, this is not speaking about what happened nearly 2,000 years ago in 70 A.D. with the destruction of the first temple. This is talking about what's going to happen in the future. What we read about in Revelation chapter 11, where it talks about the holy city is going to be trampled upon by the nations. So he says here, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by encampments of soldiers, then you shall know that her desolation that is a word that speaks about destruction is near. Jerusalem will be attacked. But there will be a remnant, the Scripture says, that's not cast out or cut off from the city. Difficult times are coming for Israel and Jerusalem. And you know why? to teach the people there that they need a Savior. That left to themselves, that the enemy, and who's that enemy? Well, read the prophecy of Zechariah. All the nations of the world. Pastor Prince asks, what about America in the last days? Now, I was born here, I love this country, but it's not the same country that I was born into. It is vastly different. And America is going to make a tragic decision to join with all the nations in the world. And you know who's going to be the leader? Edom. Have you ever read the book of Obadiah? Just one chapter. Just 21 verses. But I would encourage you to read that. Because it speaks about a final battle. A battle between the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. There's such confusion in the church today. So many people teach that Esau was a kind of innocent victim to his brother Jacob. That's not what the New Testament says. Read sometime the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, where God says, pretty good source, 
God says that Esau is a perverse and immoral man. Where God tells, and Paul writes it down, Esau I have hated. Now, don't believe what some say, that this sovereign God and God is sovereign, but that God just simply chooses to hate Esau and to love Jacob. That's not what the Bible says. Read sometime Malachi chapter 1. There you have the explanation. Why he hates Esau. Because Esau was building that which God was not delighted in. And God destroyed it. And what did Esau say? God, you can destroy it, but I will build it back up. Esau has that, that, that spirit of defiance. He does not want the things of God. So there's going to be a final war. It's what we began to speak of in Daniel chapter 8. And the nation who's going to be leading it, so says the prophecy of Obadiah, is Edom. Edom, in my opinion, is the modern-day Palestinians. There's many biblical reasons to see a correlation between them. And the Scripture tells us in Obadiah that all the nations of the world, Zechariah says it as well, are going to join with Edom in order to go up to Jerusalem for battle. But we know what's going to happen. Messiah will return. His second coming. And he is going to give victory to a remnant of Israel. Drop down, if you would, to verse 28. Israel, we've seen it. Jerusalem is surrounded by encampments of soldiers. And America will be there as well. But what should we, the believers, think? Look at verse 28. But when these things begin to be, now hear that carefully. When these things begin to be, what are we called to do? It's a commandment. He says, look upward and lift up your head. Now, that expression, to lift up your head, do you understand that? There's a psalm that says God is the lifter of the head. What does he mean by that? Well, lifting the head shows recognition. God is going to recognize his people. When these things that we have spoken of tonight begin to happen, you should have an expectation. And that expectation is God is going to recognize you. And how is he going to do that? He says, look upwards and raise your heads because... Your redemption draws near. Do you understand what he means by that? You see, in Hebrew, I understand this is Greek, but in Hebrew, we have two different words for redemption. One involves a payment for redemption. That's why Messiah came the first time, to make that payment, which he made on Passover, that's the day he was crucified, not by chance, by, but by the providence of God. In the same way that that Passover blood brought the people out of bondage, the blood of the Lamb of God, Messiah, crucified on Passover, brings us out of this world and will bring us into the kingdom of God. So there's that word for redemption that's a payment. But there's also a second word that speaks about the outcome. You can think of it this way. Ever bought a house? There is that down payment that you get into it. 
But that second word has to do with what you receive all the house. It's now yours. It's the outcome. And this is what it's talking about here. When these things begin to happen, be encouraged. Look up. Be encouraged. God is getting ready to recognize who is his redeemed people. And we're going to receive the benefits of being in that new covenant relationship. Verse 29. And he said a parable to them. Now, you all know that the New Testament, the Gospels, are full of parables. I said this morning, we studied a different parable. And I shared with them that the Hebrew word for parable, mashal, is the same word where we get the Hebrew word for government. Why? Because the message of every parable that Messiah taught, that message should govern your life. That message should rule your life. And in regard to that, he says, look at verse 29. And he said a parable to them. He says, when you see the fig tree. Now, the expectation is, be watching the fig tree. No confusion. Read Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. The fig tree is Israel. If you are obedient to the instructions of Messiah, you are going to be watching Israel. And you will have an expectation. It's not by accident that there is today in our lifetime the nation of Israel. He says, and when you are looking at the fig tree and all other trees, now why would he say that other trees, other nations? When you look at Israel compared to other nations, there is something different, very different. Look at other nations. Israel is so small, so small. But yet, the number of Nobel Prize winners compared to other countries, other peoples, the more you study Israel, see, Israel's a wonderful place. Visit it, you'll see that. But we have a problem. Our neighbors don't like us. And our neighbors are sworn to our defeat. That's nothing new. But there's still today, what? A nation of Israel. And there's going to be, it shows God's providence, God's faithfulness. So he says, watch the fig tree and all other trees. And he says, when it puts forth already, that is when it begins to blossom already, he says, watch for yourselves and know that the summer is near. Now, there's a play on word in Hebrew because this word for, for summer is very similar to the word end. It's spelled the same. There is just that one letter that's a vowel that changes it. And he's, what he's saying is, when Israel begins to blossom, when it shows its distinctiveness, that you can see God's hand upon that country, small country. But do you know that of all the nations of the world, big nations like China, Russia, America. Look at all these countries in Europe and Asia. And Israel is the number fourth country for worldwide investment. So small. It should show us God makes a difference. God can do the impossible. So he says... 
when you see the fig tree beginning to blossom, you yourselves look and you know that the summer is near. Now it's talking about a change. There is a, a harvest time. Thus also, whenever you see these things, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you that this generation... Now, when we see the things that we've spoken of tonight, these wars must be much worse than it is today. Famines, earthquakes, diseases. When we see great persecution of believers because of the name of Jesus. When you see these things beginning, know something, that the kingdom of God is drawing near. I hope that each of us can see that we're living in a unique time. Things are not always as they were. Those ones who were scoffing and will scoff and say, everything's the same throughout all generation. No. See, I'll close with this. There is an enemy that is going to rise up. And I'm speaking about the Antichrist. And if you listen to what Peter said, what Paul says, and what Yeshua said. His father is the father of lies. And the Antichrist spirit is one of deceit. And when I look at this world today, I see a world that is confused. I see a world that's being deceived. One that cannot define what Genesis 1 teaches that in the beginning, God created man, both male and female. See, this is all about one thing. I hope you see the spiritual component. Because God creates male or female. And what's happening today is this. It's simply blatant rebelliousness. We'll choose what we are, not God. We'll define ourselves, not God. It's all making man to be the God. That's the Antichrist spirit. And don't you see that it's rising up? Don't you see that spirit of change happening all throughout the world? Don't be discouraged. Understand. These things must be. The end is not now, but it is coming. And if you are in that new covenant relationship, if you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, then you have a wonderful end. You have a blessed hope that will not disappoint you have an eternal future whereby you are going to be made to be like Messiah. That you are going to be conformed to his image. You will manifest his character when you receive that new body. See, when these things begin, God's word commands us, don't be discouraged. Lift up your head. Look up. Because your redemption, that victory, that final outcome of your faith is near. These difficult times, they announce to us good news. God is going to fulfill his covenantal obligation. He is going to establish his kingdom. And for me... As I look at the Word of God, I am more and more convinced 
when I see the darkness that is coming, that we serve a holy God. We serve a righteous God. We serve a God that keeps covenant. If you're not in that new covenant relationship, don't leave this place tonight without entering into that covenant. It's so simple. All you have to do is to say, yes, I'm a sinner. What does that mean? Yes, I have violated God's word. And left to myself, I am without hope. But I believe in the hope that the word of God promises. I believe that Messiah went to that cross. He died upon that cross. He shed his blood as the full payment for all of my sin. That through the work of Messiah, all my sins, all my iniquities, all my transgressions are forgiven. And not just forgiven. Jeremiah, in that passage about the new covenant, says, and God promises, not just that he'll forgive, but he says, and I will remember their sins no more. You can have that absolute assurance by believing he died, but not just died, Paul says, but also that God raised him from the dead, believing in the resurrection of Messiah because you're going to share in that same experience. Accept that good news. It's free. And when you do, your name is written in a book, that Lamb's book of life. You want to be in that book. Father God, we thank you that you are a gracious God, that your word is true, and that through your word and faith in your only begotten Son, Yeshua, that we can have a hope that will not disappoint, a hope that will cause us to inherit your eternal promises and your eternal blessings. Father God, we give you thanks. We praise your holy name. We lift up the name Yeshua, that name above all names, thanking him for what he has done and what he's going to do when the heavens open up and he gathers up the church and he provides for us the outcome of his redemption. Lord God, we look forward to that day. And until that happens, may we walk faithfully, may we walk humbly, may we walk bearing witness to his name. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.